Dr. Parmar is a specialist in geriatric medicine. She completed medical school internal medicine residency and geriatric medicine resi residency at UBC. She is the founder and physician lead for Pacific Geriatricians Group, providing care for patients across the entire province of BC, and is an attending physician at Vancouver General Hospital. Active in research, she is a physician for the UBC Falls Pension Clinic. As part of her role as a clinical assistant professor for UBC Medicine, she regularly teaches at all levels of medication, medical education and is a medicine curriculum geriatri geriatrics theme lead. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Paramar, for being here today and I will pass it on to you now. Great, thank you so much, Alana. Uh, thank you first for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, falls is something that is very near and dear to me. Um, as Alana just mentioned, I am one of the physicians at the Falls Prevention Clinic uh, based out of Vancouver run by UBC. Um, so I'm very happy to talk about this particular concern, especially in the presentation of Parkinson's disease. Uh, I know that there will be lots of questions that will be generated from this talk. Um, so my hope is that we'll be able to get through all of the slides and I've hopefully left plenty of time at the end uh, for those questions. But please do feel free to ask your questions because um, I want this to be a, a forum where you are able to, to walk away with a little bit more information, hopefully. Um, so we're going to begin with what actually is a fall. Um, we'll then go through the concerns that we have regarding falls themselves. Why is this an issue that we are even talking about? Um, we'll then move on to some risk factors that are common for all comers uh, in terms of falls and ways to minimize those risks. And then we'll deep, deep, uh, dive deeper sorry, into Parkinson's disease um, and see what uh, concerns from Parkinson's disease actually increase your falls risk as well. And again, ways to minimize those risks. And at the end, we'll also close off with talking to your doctor about falls and, and some uh, times that you should be bringing this up with your family physician or other doctors and how to go about that. Uh, so the first question, of course, is what is a fall? Uh, and I wanted to highlight this because often it's a misused term. Um, to be uh, very clear in terms of falls, falls are not passing out. A fall is not a faint. A fall is not sitting down because I felt lightheaded. A fall is actually a sudden change in your elevation. So suddenly going from standing to sitting down on the ground or standing to laying down on the ground uh, unexpectedly. Um, it causes you to come to rest on another level, okay, according to the official medical uh, definition. Um, and it's not the result of another medical issue such as losing consciousness, um, as we mentioned before. So um, the very common thing with this is, are people who have uh, irregular heart rhythms or have palpitations um, and will suddenly lose consciousness. Um, or another um, a similar situation of people who have low blood sugar uh, will sometimes pass out because their blood sugar is low. That is not a fall. That is a symptom of another medical disease. Um, the other big important piece of a fall's definition is also that it should be a situation where you should you should be standing upright. Um, so if you are standing there and your very large dog pulls the leash and pulls you off your feet, well, that's an overwhelming external force. Um, if you're standing there and somebody else comes by and bumps you and you fall, that's an external force. Um, so that is also not a fall. That's an, an act. That is an accident. Um, but a fall is really when you should be able to stand up under your own power and you suddenly find yourself down on the ground. Okay. So. Why are we concerned about this? Uh, why are we worried about falls? Well, the first thing is that they are very common. Um, and in Canada, actually, falls are the leading cause of injury uh, amongst people over the age of 65. Uh, they're so significant that actually a third of senior Canadians will actually fall at least once. Uh, and many of those will actually suffer recurrent falls. And falls are actually also in the top three causes of hospitalization. I know people usually think of going into the hospital for more dramatic things like a heart attack or an accident where you've had a broken bone or things, uh, but actually falls are the leading uh, cause of admission to hospital uh, and presentation to an emergency room uh, all across the country. They're a concern as well, not just because they're frequent, but because they have a legacy behind them. Uh, unfortunately, falls usually result in a change uh, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, one third of, of seniors who are admitted to hospital and, and fall uh, from a fall are actually discharged to a nursing home. 
And so that's actually quite a significant thing. So that fall leads to that change in your overall mobility, in your overall independence, resulting in you actually having to move on to a nursing home. And of course, we want to avoid that at all costs. We want to keep people at home for as long as possible. Um, falls are, can also be a life-changing event in other ways in that often you'll have to, after a fall, use a walker or a cane, um, changing, you know, how you can easily move around in your own home. Uh, they often lead to a need for rehabilitation. Uh, so either working with a physiotherapist on your own uh, or needing to be admitted to a, a rehab center um, for a prolonged period of time. They're also a major risk factor for osteoporosis. And so osteoporosis is just our medical term for a bone fracture. Um, and so a, a major bone that fractures like a hip or a shoulder really changes your life uh, as well. Um, it means surgery, it means rehab, it often means needing uh, assisted devices like walkers, as we mentioned already. Um, and so the falls leading to a risk of osteoporosis is another major concern that we have. Um, and lastly, and I would actually say most importantly in my practice, is that when a fall happens, it leads to something called a fear of falling. So there's that cautiousness that comes about after you've had a fall. And often that cautiousness can actually turn into anxiety. And with that anxiety, you begin to limit yourself. Uh, you, you start to say, no, I'm not going to go out today because I might have a fall. And then that, of course, means that you end up being more sedentary. And being more sedentary is almost like the chicken and the egg. Is it the sedentary that causes the falls or is it the falls that causes the sedentary? Uh, but we know that both cause things to get worse. Um, so that is a, a major thing that we see. Um, I'll also highlight that it's not just the person themselves who falls that develops a fear of falling. It can also be their caregivers. Um, so we can see that you know if, if your loved one falls, the caregivers can start to be overly cautious and start to try and do too much for them and say, oh, no, no, stay in the chair. I'll go and get you that glass of water from the kitchen. Or it's okay, I'll carry everything for you. Um, and suddenly that person who had that one fall is not being as active as before, is not using their muscles as much as before, and becomes at higher risk of having another fall because they're losing muscle strength. So we say these are concerns that we have. Well, how do we deal with this? Well, the first thing is to look at the risk factors that a person may have for a fall. And those are usually divided into environmental risks, you know, such as slippery floors, um, you know, loose uh, cords and things like that that are easy to trip on, or things that are associated with the person themselves. Um, so, you know, any medical illnesses they may have, weakness and things like that. As we break down those risks into the person and the environment, we then also further break them down into those that we can make a difference with, so those we can modify, and those that we unfortunately have to work around, the non-modifiable risks that we have. So this is the framework that we as physicians go through, and I find it a very helpful framework to discuss with my patients as well, because it helps you understand where you should be focusing your energy and what you can actually do to minimize your risks. So the falls are associated, sorry, the falls risks associated with a person. Um, the greatest risk is a history of a previous fall. Okay, so a history of fall is, is your greatest risk factor. Age, as with all things, is also a risk factor. Uh, the third thing that is probably the most common risk factor we see is actually deconditioning. So that's a loss of muscle strength. Uh, people will often call that muscle weakness or being out of shape. Uh, some people will erroneously say that this is just normal aging and you're supposed to get weaker with time, which is not actually true. Um, but that loss of muscle strength is a big thing that we see. The fear of falling as a cause of uh, a risk factor for falls we already mentioned. Changes in vision are also an issue. Um, untreated cataracts resulting in not un being unable to see your full visual fields, glaucoma, retinal changes from diabetes, all those types of eye changes can be an issue. Uh, and so can the use of bifocals and progressive lenses. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, medications can also be a, a risk factor for falls. And after you've had a fall, they should always be reviewed. Um, inner ear problems or vestibular problems like vertigo um, can also be a concern. And chronic medical conditions like Parkinson's disease, which we'll devote some specific time to, um, stroke, peripheral neuropathy, dementia, these are all medical risk factors that can be associated with a person. Well, we say, okay, those are the personal risk factors. What ones should we be focused on? Where can we make a difference in terms of lowering our risk factors? Well, there are three of those risk factors that we know we can't do anything about. 
And those are age, because we don't have time machines, uh, the history of falls, because you can't go back and rewrite history, and also some of the chronic medical diseases, such as a stroke. You know, where when a person has suffered a stroke and is left with some deficits, we're not able to you know, regain those, though that's their new baseline that we have to actually cope with. But there is some good news because there are some modifiable risk factors, um, deconditioning, so muscle weakness being a big one, the fear of falling, visual changes in your choice of eyewear, and also your medications. So we'll focus on those. Now we'll come back to deconditioning because I want to talk about that as its own separate piece because it's very, very crucial for everyone really who's had a fall. Um, but going through the other issues there, the fear of falling, the cautiousness that comes along and then becomes anxiety really does you a detriment. Um, and following that anxiety and preventing yourself from moving actually causes deconditioning to get worse. Um, so understanding that and realizing that resting or limiting yourself is actually causing you more harm than good, I think is a very important thing. Um, it's also, under, it's also important to understand what your triggers are for that fear of falling. Is it actually that you're worried about a fall or are you more worried about the social aspect of that? Many people feel very embarrassed when they've had a fall. So is that what you're worried about? Is, are there ways that you can focus on that anxiety and work through that particularly? Um, is it a fear of not being able to call for help? if you had a fall and what would you do if there was nobody around? Uh, and are there ways to work around that? You know, is that that you would have a cell phone in your pocket at all times or is that using uh, an alert button that are that is available that can help you if you've had a fall? So it's important to look work through that, that fear of falling and see really where can we nip that anxiety in the bud if possible or where can we work through that anxiety to try and make it easier to cope and actually continue to be active through that. Um, when then we move on to vision. So of course, regular eye visits are very important. Um, you know, checking for common diseases that happen like cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, these are all important things. And they can really limit the scope of your vision, the range that you can actually see. So if you have deficits in your visual field, ensure that you're on the right medications, uh, ensure that your optometrist or your ophthalmologist has helped you with your prescriptions so you can minimize all of that. Uh, because if you can't see where you're going, how are you going to get there safely, right? Um, the other thing that we come across is a very common cause of falls um, is actually the use of bifocals, trifocals, or progressives. Uh, now, those are lenses, of course, where you have your full lens and the bottom part of it is your reader, okay? Uh, and that's where the issue comes about, um, is that when you are cautious with your walking or if you have poor posture, you will tend to be leaned forward. As you lean forward, you're going to be looking through the bottom of your lens. So you're looking through your readers, which are designed to help you read. So that means that they're designed to help you see everything up until about the level of your waist as nice and clear, because that's about the distance that you'd be holding a book or a newspaper. But if you look through that reader, anything past that, anything further than that, such as your feet, the ground, you know, a curb that you might be trying to navigate across, those are all fuzzy. So you're actually making it more difficult on yourself because your brain isn't getting the correct input. It's getting this fuzzy image of where you're walking. So it's very unsure as to where your feet should be. Uh, and it really puts you at a higher risk of falls. So our strong recommendation for all patients who come through the falls prevention clinic is to get two separate pairs of glasses. And I know that's a frustration. Um, I know that it's tough to carry around two pairs of glasses, but we have to have that conversation and say when we weigh that frustration of having two pairs of glasses versus your risk of a fall, you know, which choice do we make? Um, so having a separate pair of just distance glasses for when you're walking around is very important. Uh, and having a separate pair of readers that you can switch off for when you're actually reading is important. Okay. Uh, the next thing we look at are medications, and this is something that you would want to do with your doctor, of course, uh, is to go through your medications and say, are any of these medications putting us at higher risk of having a fall? Uh, the common ones usually are blood pressure medications that maybe haven't been adjusted in years and so now aren't the right dose anymore. Um, diabetes medications or maybe the sugars are no longer at the right target for your age or other medications that can cause drowsiness um, and also changes uh, that can affect your sensory input. So it's important to have that talk with your doctor about all of your medications and just scroll through them and say which ones potentially are causing an issue. Can we minimize any of these? Okay, now we're going to focus on deconditioning. Um, and this is 
uh, important uh, because it is the main thing that we see when patients come through the fall prevention clinic. Uh, as their cause of their falls. Uh, and especially in this last year where we've all not been able to be as active as we want to be, uh, we're seeing a far greater degree of deconditioning. Um, so the medical term for deconditioning is sarcopenia. And that basically just means a lower amount of muscle. So the your total body weight your muscle weight is actually less than it used to be. And also the effectiveness of your muscles has decreased. Um, so we call that decreased muscle mass and decreased myocyte ability in, in terms of medical terms. Um, you know, we all gain muscle quite quickly when we're younger and around the age of 30, we peak and then there's a slow decline in our, our gaining of muscle mass. Uh, but this is actually compounded uh, as we get older by being less active. Um, so medical illness is a common time where people will decondition, where they've had to be on bed rest for a you know, certain number of days. Uh, we use a rule of thumb um, within the hospital system that for every day that a patient stays lying in bed, it takes them three days of physio to regain the muscle they've lost. So it's quite profound. Um, retirement is also a major time where people will see uh, deconditioning happen. And that's because their life activity level has changed. Um, they've changed from having to have a schedule where they're active at a certain time of day and having to go to work and maybe walk around the office or walk around the work site um, to suddenly being at home now and not being as active. Uh, and their hobbies may have changed to be more sedentary ones. And unfortunately, most people don't think that they need to then replace that activity from work with exercise, but unfortunately we do. Um, so that's often a, a big drop off that we see in terms of physical strength. Um, other things that come about as well um, that causing the, the, the deconditioning are just, you know, people who are trying to, to use more uh, ex assistive devices, you know, getting a scooter uh, and using that instead of walking to the grocery store, uh, if you're able to, of course, um, all of those can lead to deconditioning. Uh, the big muscle group that we worry about with that deconditioning is are actually your hips. Um, so your hips are those muscles that you use to launch yourself out of a chair. They're also the same muscles that help keep you upright when you're walking. Uh, so your hips have to be strong and lock you in as you shift from one foot to the other as you walk. Uh, most people don't realize this, but walking is actually just the act of going from standing on one leg to standing on the other leg. And it's your hip that locks you in as you're standing on one leg. Um, your other muscles that also help out with this are your muscles of your lower back and of your stomach, of your abdomen, because those help with your posture. When you have poor posture and you're leaned forward, that puts a lot of extra stress on your hips to try and keep you upright. So those are the, the muscles we really focus on when we look at rehabilitating people who've had a fall. Uh, if you have any sort of weakness with regards to this, we always want to ensure that you're doing some exercises because if we can counteract them, You'll be able to recover yourself uh, from a stumble if you were to have a stumble in the future. You'll also develop that confidence and fight that fear of falling as well. Uh, an easy rule of thumb for yourself to see if, if you are suffering from some hip weakness is just to try and stand up from a chair and stand up without using your arms. Okay, so take your hands, clasp them in front of you and stand up from that chair. If you're able to stand up without using your arms, your hips are probably reasonable and actually an appropriate level of strength. But if you have to use your hands to push yourself up out of a chair, then your, your hips are definitely weak and you need to be doing some exercise. Um, what exercises should we be doing? Well, thankfully, there are a lot of options out there. Uh, one of the most commonly known ones is something called the Strategies and Actions for Independent Living. It's shortened down to the acronym SAIL. So these are exercises that doctors, physiotherapists, kinesiologists, you know, everyone who really works within the falls field are very aware of. Um, and they're easily available online for free, which was quite uh, a great thing that the, the group that put this out did. Um, so those are great exercises and they come in three different stages. So depending upon your current strength level, you can have the stage that's targeted towards yourself. Uh, and if you start at level one, then through time, hopefully you'll be able to work to level two and eventually level three and achieve your goals of improving your strength. There are also some great organized classes that are out there. Uh, the most common known one is OsteoFit. Now I know right now a lot of these classes are not running, um, but we are hopeful that over the next coming few months that they will be back up and running. And they're usually found at community centers and sometimes at local gyms. 
another great program is something called Steady Feet, uh, very similar to OsteoFit and easily available um, through community centers. And these days also you can try and join some virtual classes or even find videos for these online. And the last thing to talk about is actually Tai Chi. Now, Chai Chi is a fantastic set of exercises for balance. Uh, and when you line up all of the different types of exercises and you compare them, Tai Chi actually comes out as the winner and that it is the one that provides the most benefit for your core strength uh, and also decreases your risk of falls the most. Uh, one thing that I will add in here is that yoga and aquafit are often exercises that people enjoy and they have a great impact on your health and they're very appropriate for certain things. Uh, but if you're hoping to improve your falls risk for it by doing yoga or doing aquafit, you actually won't. Um, now, yoga is not an exercise that focuses on holding your body weight while standing as much. You spend a lot of time doing floor exercises and you spend a lot of time stretching. Um, and so for that reason, yoga doesn't target the right muscle groups for falls. Uh, Aquafit as well is a great exercise for your heart, but you're doing it in the water. So you're buoyant. And so while you're buoyant in the water, you're not carrying all of your body weight. So in fact, from a falls point of view, you're almost cheating uh, by having part of your body weight held up by that water. So if you are doing those exercises, they're fantastic for other reasons, but make sure that you're also doing some resistance training as well. Now, we know what exercises we should be doing, but we're not always successful in them. So there are a lot of barriers to us getting exercises started. Um, the usual one is actually motivation or that difficulty in changing your, your lifestyle, making it part of your routine. Uh, and there's no perfect answer for everyone in terms of this. You really have to look at yourself and say, what is my personality type? How am I going to get myself doing this? Um, that may be using a calendar, uh, you know, marking it down so that you feel you have to do it. That might be getting a buddy to do exercises with you so that you're enjoying that social aspect of it. Um, that could be giving yourself a bit of a reward at the end of the exercises. Um, it could be working it in with your other routines. Uh, one thing that works for a lot of my patients is if they like to watch a program on TV. So not a recorded program where you skip the commercials, but one that you watch live. Uh, for example, watching the news. Uh, that's a whole hour long program, but there are about 20 to 25 minutes of commercial breaks. Uh, so leave your exercises beside you. And every time a commercial break comes on, pick up that paper and do two or three minutes of the exercises. When the program comes back on, take a rest, and again, with the next, set of, uh, the next set of commercials, do your exercises again. And next thing you know, you've watched the news over the last hour and you've also got your 20 minutes of exercise done. Uh, the other thing that you can look at as well is whether or not someone to coach you would be helpful. Uh, and that could be a personal trainer, that could be a physiotherapist, that could be a kinesiologist. Um, some people's personality really does well uh, with having someone there to coach you. I always want to highlight, though, that you want to find a person whose goal is to coach you, not just to give you therapy during your sessions. So with deconditioning, you don't need things like ultrasound or needling or whirlpool work or anything like that. Those are for other issues. With deconditioning, you want someone who is going to be going through those exercises with you, coaching you, giving you advice on how to stand your posture a little bit taller or do this a little bit differently. So you want that coach and someone you're going to come back to and feel that relationship that you're seeing that improvement in your strength and that they're actually encouraging you to continue on with that. Um, it's not as if you need to be doing this for the rest of your life with this coach, but you do need to be doing these exercises for the rest of your life. So you, you want to be spending your time with this coach, learning how to do them on your own, learning how to optimize that and really enforce it into your lifestyle. Other than exercise, there is thankfully a pill that we can offer to people because everyone was always looking for a magic pill. Um, but this one thankfully is not a medicine. Uh, this is actually vitamin D. So vitamin D is an important building block for muscles, just like it is for bones. Uh, and unfortunately for, can for Canadians across the board, we're usually all deficient. We just don't get enough sunshine and we also don't get, don't get the right kind of sunshine. Uh, so our skin doesn't make enough for us. 
Uh, so for this reason, we always recommend vitamin D to our patients who've had a fall. Through our studies as well, vitamin D has been shown to decrease your risk of falls, independent of exercise or not. Vitamin D does help decrease your risk of falls. Um, when you put vitamin D together with exercises, you actually reach your goals of exercise that much faster as well. So it's important to have the exercises and the vitamin D on board. The most common dose of vitamin D is 1,000 units by mouth a day. And most people will know that D3 is the type of uh, vitamin D that you want. Um, that is, to be honest, the most common type that is sold now. I don't think many manufacturers sell the other types of vitamin D. Uh, in, in grocery stores anymore. Uh, but realize that that's the target dose. But before you start it, make sure you talk with your doctor because of course there are always personal issues that people may have like kidney disease and other things that may mean that they need less or maybe even need more of their vitamin D. Uh, but if you've had a fall, definitely talk to your doctor about starting on vitamin D and, and find out what the right dose is for you. So those are the risks that were associated with a person. Now, what about the risks that are associated with an environment? And so those are many. Um, those are things like poor lighting, uh, lack of handrails, grab bars in the bathroom, chairs that are too low for a person, uh, kind, uh, things that might be obstructing your path, such as carpets that are loose or cords that are on the ground, uh, that cat that won't move out of the way as you're trying to walk past it. Uh, poor footwear is also an issue, uh, you know, worn off soles that might be too slippery now or still wearing shoes with a bit of a heel on them when you've got balance issues. Um, and also your gait aids being the wrong height may are also a concern that we see often in terms of environmental causes of falls. So once again, we go back and we say, well, which of these can we make a difference with and what are ones that we're going to have to accept? Uh, and to be honest, most of these things you can make a difference with in your own home environment where you can change things. Unfortunately, out in public, there will always be spaces that are not ideal. Uh, you know, there will be places that have dim lighting. Um, there will be places that have uh, inappropriate handrails because they're, they're more decorative than they are strong. Uh, obviously, there aren't raised toilet seats in public bathrooms. Um, so having to work and adapt to those ones in, in the public places is a difficulty that we often see. Uh, but we try to, to minimize those risks in our homes. Um, and you can see here, poor lighting is a big one that we see. Um, you know, this can be an easy fix, just changing your bulbs. Uh, you know, commonly people used to have much dimmer bulbs, uh, but now with the uh, kind of advent of LED bulbs, it's quite easy to change those out into brighter white lights um, that where you can see uh, much easier. Uh, I'm in the clinic today. You can probably see that I'm almost washed out because the lights are so bright. And actually that, that was done on purpose. And that was because we wanted to ensure that we had the brightest white lights possible so that our clients who have difficulty walking are able to see the full, um, the full spectrum of the, the clinic as best as possible. Um, we also then look at things like uh, looking at if there are loose uh, cords, uh, whether there are carpets and things like that that you might have around the house. Um, if you can tie up those cords and move them off to the side or move them up and around the wall if possible, but if not, highlighting them very clearly uh, so that you can see them. So taking a bit of colored tape, like painter's tape, which is always nice and bright and green and just putting that over the cord. So one, the cord isn't loose and getting caught, but also you see it and you remember to walk up and over that cord. Uh, if you have loose rugs and carpets that you can roll up, that's of course best. But if not, again, trying to ensure that they don't have a, a lip to them that's pushed up so that your foot hits them, but try to keep them nice and flat um, or even just taping or adhering them down on the edge so that if you were to scuff on them, you scuff up and over rather than getting caught under that uh, carpet. Uh, low seating is something that we try to work on. So looking at the height uh, of things like your toilet. So getting a, a, a raised toilet seat, which is easily available at a lot of different places that sell medical equipment. Um, looking at the chair that you're sitting in, maybe it is too low and you're having to almost cannonball yourself out of it. Uh, having a higher chair so it's easier to slip in and out of it would be best. Um, we also look at reinforcing grab bars uh, and reinforcing handrails. So Taking a look around your house and seeing, is this handrail loose? Do I need to get that tightened up or should it be replaced? Uh, are there grab bars that we should be putting into our shower or around our toilet? Um, now, all of these, of course, are a big ask for people. Um, and they say, well, how am I supposed to know what's right or wrong? Uh, and thankfully, there is a specialty specifically for this, and those are occupational therapists. So occupational therapists are available to everyone across British Columbia um, through home and community. 
Uh, so all of the different health authorities actually have occupational therapists who are available to do safety assessments. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can always ask your family doctor for a referral onto an occupational therapist and they'll come into your home and they'll highlight all of these concerns that they have uh, and they'll be able to, to let you know, how, you know if your grab bars need to be put in place, um, if your handrail is actually strong enough and just give you some workarounds through that. Uh, the other thing that they'll be able to help you with is actually measuring your gait aid. Okay, so whether that is your cane or your walker, people will sometimes just buy those themselves and bring them home and set them up and feel that they're comfortable, not realizing that it might be too high or too low and actually putting you at risk of falls. Uh, so occupational therapists are actually trained to measure you appropriately for that. Um, if you're buying your gate aid from a medical store, they should also be able to measure for you. Uh, or if you're seeing a physiotherapist, they will be able to measure for you as well. But it's important to ensure that it's the right height for you. Okay. So that's a, a quick kind of overview of the risks of falls for all for all comers, and that's where we start with everyone. Uh, but we also look at Parkinson's disease itself, and we know that Parkinson's disease is actually a major risk factor for falls, uh, with over 60% of people with Parkinson's disease suffering from a fall, and just shy of further 40% of those people having recurrent falls. Uh, the falls aren't necessarily linked to the severity of your disease. So the falls may actually occur many years prior. And when we look at the studies and they're able to retrospectively go through and say, if someone was diagnosed with Parkinson's and we call that year zero, they are actually at a higher risk of a history of a fall even 10 years back. Um, we also know that up to 15 years back that people who have Parkinson's disease are at a higher risk of having a fracture. So they're actually at higher risk of having osteoporosis as well. So some of the falls risks that are particular to Parkinson's disease are the symptoms that we see uh, with Parkinson's disease, motor symptoms, um, the rigidity that we see, uh, especially that truncal rigidity, the inability to turn comfortably. Uh, classically, doctors will ask you about being able to turn in bed. Uh, and if you're having trouble turning in bed, that's, you know, that's a very specific sign for Parkinson's disease. It's also a very specific uh, risk factor for falls because you're not able to pivot or turn comfortably. So instead, you'll have to have a cautious turn where you actually turn your feet shuffling slowly, um, which again puts you at a higher risk of falls. Another part of the rigidity is the decreased arm swing that we often see with Parkinson's disease. So our arm swing actually helps to keep our momentum going and keep our balance for our, our upper body. And if you lose that arm swing to counteract, then your core is actually having to work that much harder to keep you upright. So again, another risk factor uh, for a fall. Some of our specific Parkinson's medications also put us at risk uh, of falls. The dopamine agonist, so primiprexol, ropinerol, um, that class of medications particularly have the risk of dyskinesias that are much higher, so the unintended movement that you can see, um, and also just in general puts you at risk of higher, uh, higher risk of falls. Uh, when we look at things like Cinemet or any of the other levodopas that are out there, it's not the low doses that put you at risk, but it is the very high doses. So that's when we're talking about people who are getting 800, 1,000 milligrams in a day. That's where we kind of see that risk of falls actually increase. Um, and again, that's to do with the higher risk of having that uncontrolled movement, and uh, the dyskinesias that can happen. Another risk factor particular to Parkinson's disease is a history of neurosurgical intervention. So a history of deep brain stimulation uh, is actually the instrumentation and the act of having the surgery puts you at higher risk uh, of having a fall. Um, the changes that happen with walking, so the shuffling gait, obviously not being able to lift your foot up as high, uh, so you're more likely to scuff uh, against those car loose rugs that might be there or not being able to get your foot up and over a curb if you need to. The smaller steps as well put you at a higher risk of, of falling. Uh, the history of freezing and the difficulty setting off, so the difficulty beginning, which we often call the, call the festination, so the wanting to take a step forward, but actually taking several steps in the same spot before you're able to move yourself forward, again, puts you at risk of falls. Urinary incontinence, a common symptom uh, of Parkinson's disease, puts you at risk of falls because it causes you to rush to the bathroom, not because there's any sort of neurological connection there, but just that frequent need to rush to the bathroom puts you at higher risk. 
uh, postural instability, which is another sign or symptom of Parkinson's disease. So that is the change in blood pressure that happens with the disease. So when you're sitting, you feel well, but as soon as you stand up, gravity is your enemy uh, and your blood pressure drops. Uh, and of course, if your blood pressure drops, then you are at are a higher risk of feeling a bit wobbly and, and having a fall. Um, my previous talk had been about Parkinson's and dementia, and at that time we'd, we talked about how actually 80% of Parkinson's patients may develop dementia in the long run. Um, so dementia is a risk factor for, for falls. And also the difficulty with dual tasking. So the difficulty with walking and carrying on a conversation at the same time uh, is a common thing that we see with Parkinson's disease and obviously a risk factor for falls as well. So if we look at these, we'll again divide them between the, those that we cannot make a difference with, those that we have to adapt to, the non-modifiable ones, and the modifiable risk factors. So unfortunately, the non-modifiable ones are, of course, the history of neurosurgery, because we can't go back in time and prevent you from having the surgery. And often, I don't, I don't want people to walk away thinking that the surgery was a bad idea because of the falls. We have to balance those risks, right? And there are a lot of benefits from having those surgeries. So if you've had it, I don't want you to feel bad about that, but realize that it is a risk factor that we have to uh, have to adapt to. Um, and of course, the dementia is something that we are not able to reverse, uh, and so something that we have to adapt to. There are quite a few of the modifiable risk factors, though, that we see here. Um, so when we look at the rigidity, of course, the rigidity is something that can be treated with your medications. So if you're finding that you are having more times of freezing or more times of rigidity, you should be bringing that up with your Parkinson's doctor, whether that is your neurologist or your geriatrician or your family doctor who's following you, um, but talking about ways to tweak your medications so that you're not having those moments of rigidity. Um, your medications otherwise as well, we'd want to review. So are there medications that we could adjust? So do you need to be on uh, one of those dopamine agonists or could you be transferred on to Cinemet, which is considered slightly lower risk for falls? Um, other medications as well, if you're on those for incontinence and other things, some of them may have risk factors for drowsiness. Are those medications that we can adjust? The gait changes that we talk about, so the walking changes such as the shuffling gait um, and the fascinations are ones that we can try and work on. Uh, with the shuffling gait, we have found that people who do targeted exercises for their hips are actually able to overcome their shuffling a little bit. They're actually, with that extra strength of their hips, able to come up and over with their, with their step, so less likely to trip on things. So. Exercises are important for that. Um, for the fascination, so that inability to get started, we do know that actually having lines for you to walk over is a great cue for your brain to be able to help you to get through that. So whether that is leaving lines on the ground with some tape so that a person can actually see that line and have something to cross over, um, whether that is just putting a small stick, uh, such as the stick handle of a broom or something like that in front of you so that you see that to get started and walk over. Um, those are all things that you can look at. In terms of the incontinence, um, this is something that we look at and say, well, can we prevent the, the urgency? Uh, and the big thing from that is actually timed voiding. Okay, uh, so when we look at timed voiding, that is going to the bathroom at certain times throughout the day, whether or not you have the urge to go and trying to empty your bladder as best you can. And that helps to prevent your bladder from becoming overly full and dealing with the incontinence in the long run. Uh, we also look at the use of continence pads. Right, so it's often not just that urge to go to the bathroom, but it's that fear that I'm going to have an accident that causes people to rush and misstep and then have a fall. Uh, so having continence pads on board means that you're not as worried about having that accident, especially in a public place or even at home, um, so that you have that feeling that even if you don't make it to the bathroom, it's okay, let's take our time, let's walk safe, safely, let's walk with the lights on and know where we're going. For the postural instability, so that feeling of wooziness or, or that feeling of low blood pressure when you first stand up, you can have, uh, also have medications adjusted. It might be that your blood pressure medications need to go down or you might need to have other medications added in. There are a couple that we use uh, quite frequently for this symptom in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and it's also training yourself to get up slowly. So knowing that when you first get up from bed that you should swing your legs over the side of the bed and sit at the side of the bed for a good minute wait there in that seated position. And then when you stand, you want to stand up nice and slowly holding onto something and stand for a full minute before you try to set off and actually start walking. 
Uh, with the difficulty with dual tasking, that's where, of course, we'll also make some lifestyle changes where we'll try to get into the habit of if we want to talk, stop, have your conversation and then continue on with walking. Also letting your caregivers and other loved ones know that they shouldn't be trying to talk to you while you're walking, that we should just be focusing on that walking safely so we can get to our destination. Okay, so this is just um, just going over what we just discussed. Okay, uh, now coming back to those gait changes, as I said, with the shuffling, uh, it can be quite helpful to do those exercises. And I wanted to bring up again here Tai Chi. Okay, so Tai Chi has one uh, versus all of the other exercises when it comes to improving your risk of falls. So sorry, decreasing your risk of falls, particularly with Parkinson's patients. Um, so if you have an interest in Tai Chi, whether that be joining a group or looking at some videos online, I'd really recommend looking into that. Uh, walking overall is also a great exercise. Um, so it's important to continue to walk so that you gain that muscle strength back. Uh, and one study that has been that has come out uh, in Parkinson's disease actually showed that walking where there are obstacles was actually far superior. And the way that they did this was actually using virtual reality. Now this also translated to real life. Okay, so they found that walking outside where there are tree roots in the sidewalk, where there are puddles to walk around, uh, where the grass may not be perfectly even, versus walking on a treadmill or walking on a perfectly flat path, that walking where there are challenges is actually better for you and did not increase your risk of falls, but rather decreased your risk of falls. Um, so I'd really encourage people, if you can, to get out and walk just around your neighborhood um, so that you have more of that challenging terrain where you get your exercise. Now, when we talk about the risks of falls, we should always talk about osteoporosis. Uh, and I wanted to highlight this for people who have concerns with falls, that you should be screened for osteoporosis. Uh, osteoporosis means fragile bones, okay? Uh, and it means that you've either had a fall from standing height where you've broken a bone, or you've had a test, a bone mineral density test done that shows that your bone strength is quite poor. And for that, we actually use standard deviations, so the kind of standard normal curve that we look at things. And so if your bone strength is in the lower second percentile, we know we call that osteoporosis, and that's an extreme risk of having a fracture. The guidelines in British Columbia are, regardless of your history of falls, everyone over the age of 65 should be having a baseline bone density. So if you haven't had one, I'd ask you to talk to your doctor about it because it's important if you have a risk of falls to screen yourself for osteoporosis. We can make a difference with your bone strength. We can adjust your calcium, we can adjust your vitamin D, we can look at your exercises. And there are also specific medications for osteoporosis that can prevent a fracture. Um, and we want to prevent those fractures because they can be life-changing. You know, we talked about previously having a hip fracture and suddenly needing a gait aid. Um, the honest truth with this as well is that there is a high risk of mortality associated with a hip fracture. Uh, we know that many people who suffer a hip fracture don't actually make it back home. Um, so we want to prevent this if at all possible. So if you have any of these risk factors, let's screen you for them sooner um, so that we can deal with them. Um, another thing to realize as well is that um, fractures can lead to significant chronic pain. Uh, so we want to avoid that and prevent ourselves from limiting our exercise and also limiting our medication needs. Uh, there is a theory, in fact, that osteoporosis and falls are actually part of the same disease. Uh, they're now being coined as the term of osteosarcopenia, um, which is just a fancy word for falls and fracture. Uh, and there are lots of reasons why we think this. One is that, of course, higher risk of falls means higher risk of fracture. They, they move together, but also they're both tied to low vitamin D levels, um, and they're both treated in the same way in that they respond to, to resistance exercises. Uh, so important to, to, to screen for that. Okay, uh, now the last thing we're coming up to is when to talk to your doctor. Uh, and the short answer to that is anytime you've had a fall. Uh, any fall is considered abnormal, okay? Uh, people will often normalize things based upon age or they'll normalize things based upon their, uh, their medical history. Uh, but we don't want that to happen. We want these to get screened for because we can make a difference to prevent the next one from happening um, and also help prevent fear of falling and all those other concerns. So if you've had a fall, which is that fall from standing height, um, then you should be going in to see your family doctor uh, or your specialist if you have an appointment coming up. Uh, they are common, so we are used to seeing them. So don't feel that you're going to be uh, the odd one who shows up and says, I fell a week ago. Um, 
just because you had a fall and you didn't go in right away doesn't mean you can't go in later on and get all of the screening done and actually you should be getting all of that done. Um, you should also at that time be talking about your bone density because as we said, if you've had one fall, you're at high risk of a fracture. So make sure that your bone densities are up to date and that your osteoporosis has been screened for. Uh, if you are someone that your family doctor has concerns about their balance and feels they need some extra expertise, there are specialists out there um, who work with you. Uh, so within the Vancouver area, there's the UBC-based uh, uh, Falls Clinic, which is actually, it's UBC run, but it's based out of Vancouver General Hospital. Um, there are also geriatricians like myself across the province who offer Falls assessments. Um, this is something that we deal with quite often and, and really want to be seeing more of to help prevent them. Uh, if you happen to live, live in a region where there aren't geriatricians available to you, we also do these assessments virtually now. Um, this is our new reality and it's not ideal, but we found ways to work through it and still make a big difference. So don't feel that you should you know, just minimize it because you don't have access to care. Now in British Columbia, everyone does. Um, so if you've had a fall, definitely get screened and referred on if your family doctor thinks appropriate. Um, it's also important to know that all the treatment plans are, are available across the board as well. We talked about the exercise programs like SAIL that are out there, physiotherapists are all well trained in falls prevention and, and rehabilitation. So things that can be done for you, prescriptions that your doctors can write for you for physio that you'll be able to work with them in the, your own community. Uh, and also your medications can be adjusted uh, as needed. So. That brings us to the end, so I'll just summarize here for us before we go to questions. Uh, so falls are very common. They're a common, lead, they're a common cause of hospitalization, admission to nursing home, life-changing events like needing a, a walker, uh, and also qu overall quality of life. All falls should be worked up, okay? There aren't any normal falls that we just write off. All falls should be worked up because there are risk factors that we can make a difference with. Minimizing your environmental risk factors like the lighting and grab bars and other things is an important thing to do as well to minimize your risks. Uh, and if you're wondering what you should be doing, you can always ask for an occupational therapist review, which is available across British Columbia, available for free um, through your home and community uh, services. Parkinson's disease itself has risk factors that increase your risk of falls. Um, these can be the rigidity from the disease itself or some of the side effects from the medications that we commonly use. Um, and because of this, if you have Parkinson's, you should be screened by a specialist for your falls risk. Bone health, so risk of fractures should always be at the top of your mind after you've had a fall to ensure that we're, we're preventing a, a, the risk of a fracture. Exercise, exercise, exercise uh, is the foundation for our treatment, um, specifically those resistance exercises. Uh, and Tai Chi out of those is, is the leading one. But if you're not interested in Tai Chi, you can get a specialized exercise program for yourself or do other programs like OsteoFit or Steady Feet. Vitamin D is very important uh, for preventing your risk of falls. And everyone, everyone who's had a fall should be on vitamin D, but talk to your doctor about the right dose for you. Um, and as I said before, if, you're, if you've had a fall, talk to your family doctor, they'll begin your workup. Uh, if they feel that you need to see a specialist, the care is available to you. Um, so you can always be present on to the Falls Prevention Clinic uh, or similar specialized clinic or to a geriatrician. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation there. And I will move on to any questions that we may have. Okay, so we have a couple questions here. Uh, so one of them is what about karate? Um, so karate actually hasn't been studied specific to falls risk. Um, it is very similar to Tai Chi in that you were doing a lot of standing exercises. Uh, you were doing a lot of time shifting your weight from one leg to another. So if you ext extrapolate from that, then yes, karate and the other martial arts are considered a good exercise for balance. Um, and so that's why myself and my colleagues will say that if you're interested in something similar to Tai Chi, but maybe slightly different uh, style like karate, uh, that it would still be very good for your balance retraining. Um, and the next question that we have here is, is there any problem with vitamin D interacting with levodopa? Uh, and the short answer is no, you don't have to worry about your levodopa and your vitamin D. Uh, you do worry about levodopa interacting with things like magnesium and calcium and also interacting with things like proteins. Um, but with vitamin D itself, you can take them at the same time and you don't have to space them out either. Okay. 
Uh, the next question is, are prism glasses helpful? Uh, so prism glasses, for those who do not know, help to change um, the refraction if you happen to have a malalignment of your eye. So if your eyes are not seeing in the exact same uh, angle, the prism will actually adjust for that. Uh, so if you do have that concern where you have your eyes having that, we call it diplopia, so seeing double vision, um, then they will be quite helpful for correcting that. Um, it's important though with those prism glasses to, to ensure that they are they are actually titrated for your distance. Uh, so sometimes people, when they get their prism glasses, will want them so that they're actually for reading. Uh, but in, when you do get them made, be sure that they're actually the prescription for the prism correction for distance glasses to prevent falls. Okay, uh, the next question is about rock steady boxing. Uh, now I have to admit, I don't know pr any particulars about rock steady boxing itself. Um, so I'm not able to answer that question for you fully, I'm sorry. Uh, but if it is an exercise where you are standing on your feet and shifting from one leg to the other often, like a lot of other boxing uh, exercises do, then yes, that would still be helpful for you. Um, tai Chi is slightly better though than the boxing exercises that we consider because it does ask you to hold your weight for a longer period of time, much like karate does. Um, so karate, you do have quick movements, but you also have slow controlled movements. Boxing tends to be fast movements. Um, and those aren't as helpful because you're not having to control your muscles as much. So you want more of a slow, steady exercise uh, where you're having to hold your weight, say, for a five to 10 second count before you're shifting over to a different kind of position. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to put them into the chat. Okay, so any suggestions for walking where there may be ice under the snow? Um, so I actually grew up in the central interior, so I, I feel your pain on that one. Um, there are some things that you can do. Of course, you know, if it's your own home environment, trying to ensure that you've, you've salted so that it's more slush than it is ice under the snow. Um, having supportive footwear with a good grip is, of course, something else that's helpful. Uh, and the last thing is actually using walking sticks. Um, so not a cane that is short, but actually using walking poles, almost like Nordic walking poles or ski poles, the ones that you actually have to hold up straight and your arms are actually straight up against your shoulders. Those can actually be bought with a little pick at the end of them so that you can dig into the ice. Um, they'll help with your posture, but they also help to prevent you from slipping on the ice. Um, so that is a suggestion that we have uh, for patients who are, are walking in areas where there is ice. Um, so the next question is, do we need a doctor referral to get occupational therapist evaluations? Um, so you don't necessarily need a doctor's uh, um, referral if you already are connected with a case manager. So if you're already connected with home and community, um, then you can just ask your case manager to put in the referral. Um, you can also self-refer uh, to your local home and community. Uh, so if you search the Ministry of Health website, they will have the different regions and they'll all have phone numbers there where you can self-refer. Um, if you're not able to navigate through that, though, it, it, doctors have to put in these referrals quite often. Um, so it is a simple thing for us to do as well. So um, if you can't find those phone numbers to self-refer yourself, just ask your family doctor. They'll be able to do it for you quickly. Okay. Uh, the next question comes about about Zumba. Um, so Zumba is a, a great standing exercise, but it is more of a dance-like exercise where you're moving quite quickly. Um, and so Zumba, you know, is great for cardiovascular exercise, uh, but when it comes specifically for that slow, steady exercise that we're looking for balance retraining, Tai Chi would still be considered superior to Zumba in that regard. Uh, and again, it's because you want to be doing these movements where you're having to move yourself and hold them for a count of five or 10 seconds, because holding that posture is really where your core strength is challenged. Um, so Zumba, very quick movement comparatively, so not as good, uh, but still, as I said, an excellent exercise for other things. Okay, uh, so a question comes here about some alcohol sugars are said to be effective to improve gait. Mannitol and trehalose are used. Is there any science behind this? Um, so the short answer to that is no. <laughs> uh, there have been studies that have looked at this. Um, and to see if these are actually been, the mannitol particularly has had many studies that have done for it. Trehalose, a little bit less, um, but they haven't actually panned out to be a significant improvement. Okay. Uh, and the concern with mannitol is that if you do take too much of it, you can actually cause diarrhea as well. So it's not without its risks. 
so we do not recommend uh, using any of the uh, alcohol sugars, as you've mentioned here, for preventing a, a risk of falls. Uh, when we look at it from a biochemical point of view, the only thing that has shown promise to date has been vitamin D. Okay, uh, the next question that comes up is, I use a walker as I'm having trouble holding on to, okay, and you're having trouble holding on to it for your arm strength. Um, would hip exercises help? Uh, yes, they would. Um, so if you're having trouble holding onto your walker, that means that you're putting an awful lot of stress on your upper body because your legs aren't holding you up as much as they should be. Uh, ideally, when you're using a walker, a walker should only be there for posture. It should not be there for carrying your weight around. So you should be able to be strong enough on your hips that you're nice and straight and you're only having to use the fingertips to push your walker forward. You shouldn't have to be having to hold onto it fully. Um, and if you're having trouble keeping yourself upright, it's probably because your hips are weak and putting too much pressure on your arms. So using hip exercises will very much help in that situation. Okay. A bit of a lull in the questions. Uh, please, if you have them, keep them coming. Dr. Parmer, are there any uh, frequently asked questions you get from patients about falls at your clinic that you can think of? Um, I think uh, the biggest one that comes to me is that, uh, well, because I'm falling, I shouldn't exercise, right? I should take it easy. <laughs> um, that's the biggest question that comes across is that uh, people often think that their their movement needs to be limited because of their history of falls. And they're always looking for me to tell them what is a safe movement to do um, and what they should be avoiding. Uh, and I think that's a pitfall a lot of people come across is that you actually shouldn't be avoiding any exercises. You should be moving in normal movements as best as you can and challenging yourself uh, as best as you can in that situation. Okay, um, I see one more question here from Stan. Uh, he's asking about golf. Uh, now, golf is great if you're walking the course. Um, the, the act of swinging itself and the rest of it uh, is not actually uh, beneficial for falls risk because of the twisting motions and the rest of it. Um, and if you're using the cart uh, as you're on the course, it's not as helpful. But if you are walking the course, um, then yes, that extra walking from golf can be helpful in terms of your falls risk. Um, I see another question here from uh, another person saying, is cycling too adventurous? Um, that's a that's a person by person answer, to be quite honest. Um, cycling uh, is not necessarily associated with falls risk. Um, it can be associated with your balance if you have issues with inner ear balance. Um, but if cycling actually doesn't use your core muscles of balance, it doesn't use your uh, hips uh, and your abdominals and your lower back in the same way that you do when you're walking. Um, so whether or not you can cycle if you had a history of falls is not an easy answer to give you, unfortunately. Um, I will add though that cycling is not uh, necessarily an exercise that helps with your falls risk. Uh, again, very similar to aquafit where you're buoyant in the water when you're on a bicycle because you're pedaling, you're not actually moving the full body weight. Uh, the wheels are helping you with that. Um, so walking would actually be considered superior to cycling when we're looking at falls risk. And I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, the last one we see here is what about a stationary bike? Um, so a stationary bike, as I said before, would be very similar to even a road bike in that you're not carrying your full body weight. So very good exercise for your heart health, uh, but not a good exercise for falls itself. Um, the next question we have here is the fear of falling also includes fear of being able to get up from the floor. Does OsteoFit or Steady Feet address these fears at all? Um, so they do in the way that they help you improve your strength. Um, OsteoFit and Steady Feet are targeted towards people who've had falls. Um, so they do work on exercises of standing up, of getting up off the ground. They give you those tools of knowing how to, to move safely. Um, and they also give you the tools of the stronger hips. So you will be able to launch yourself up off of the ground uh, if you do find yourself on, on uh, suffering a fall. So yes, they are helpful for that.
Any further questions? Okay, well, it looks like we're approaching two o'clock here. It, it is two o'clock now, and I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Parmar, I want to thank you for such an informative presentation. Um, it does look like we have one more question. Back to golf. Recent article in the Sun that golf better for people with PD than Tai Chi. Um, Any comments on that? Yeah, so that was one study that hasn't actually held up to the rigors of science yet. Um, I think that uh, that one was also very specific in that people were walking the entire course and actually taking their bags with them. Um, so when we look at overall the other studies uh, that have compared golf to uh, Parkinson's disease in the past, uh, sorry, uh, have compared golf to Tai Chi in the past, Tai Chi has always won. Um, so we still strongly recommend Tai Chi over golf um, for people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and the last question there I see is any tips for fear of falling? Um, that's a that's a big question that comes up. I think the biggest thing is to realize that you have to keep moving, uh, and every day that you move and you don't suffer a fall helps to get, build that confidence back that you're not falling as much. Okay. Um, and then I see a last one. I have not been tested for osteo, but my friends tell me that. The medication for osteo, and so I think that one got cut off there, uh, is worse than the disease. Um, I would have to I would have to disagree with that one. Um, the osteoporosis medications have gotten a lot of um, bad uh, press in the past, but that has actually all been debunked of late in the last ten years, uh, and they are actually very safe, and that's why they are recommended at this time. Um, so I would say that uh, the if you do have osteoporosis or you're over the age of 65, definitely get screened and have a conversation with your doctor about it because the medications are safe and actually very well tolerated. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much for all of your guys' great questions. And thank you again, Dr. Parmar, for putting on such an informative presentation and answering all of our questions. Um, we have recorded this webinar, so it will be posted on the website um, in about a week. And I hope to see you all for the final talk in the symposium series. Have a good afternoon. Bye now.